a warm welcome to all. I've got, I'm suffering from a, a little cold, so excuse my my voice. It is what it is. So this is a it's supposed to be an hour long talk. I'm not going to talk an hour, just so you know. I do have a couple who are going to witness with me a little later on. What I want to do is set the stage, first of all, about evangelization and just give you some very basic things that many of you already know. But it's just to set our hearts on fire once again. So I think it's very important that we have a fire in our hearts and our bellies for evangelization. Secondly, I'll talk about leadership, how over the years I've been involved in leadership. And I have to say, it's been since I'm ordained that I had a fire in my heart to begin evangelization. I'm not sure if I even knew what I was doing at the beginning. It was evangelization, but that's what I was doing. And I'll share a little bit about that in a moment. Then I have sheets that I'll give you later on, just giving you some ideas of things that I'm doing, I've done, that can be done quite easily in parishes. You don't always need to have the pastor if he enables. One of the things that I'm very good at doing is enabling people. So if anybody can up to me and say, Father, I'd like to start a group, I said, well, go right ahead. <laughs> and that's how I get a lot of things done, you see. Now, it's not always perfect, but life's messy. Life's not perfect, so we don't worry about that. Okay. So, the new evangelization. When John the twenty third started, stated the reasons for convoking the Second Vatican Council, he made it clear that his hope was that the work of the council would result in a renewal of the church that would enable the church to communicate the gospel more effectively in the modern world. The post-Vatican popes have shared this understanding of the desire ever since the outcome of the council. It's interesting, at the first Vatican council, the word evangelization, evangelium, was only mentioned once in reference to the gospels. But In the Second Vatican Council documents, the term evangelization is mentioned, or evangelizing is mentioned 206 times. So you can see the great transformation that's happened. The initiator of of real evangelization, you could say, in the, the modern church has been Pope Paul VI. It was Paul VI who really began this movement of speaking of the United Nations, going all over the world as much as he possibly could till he got too old to travel. John Paul II imaged that type of behavior later on in his papacy. And it was Paul VI who wanted to make the church of the 20th century ever better fitted for proclaiming the gospel of the peep to the people of God. Then John Paul II obviously continued that. I mean, he was the master of evangelization. He's the one who who coined the term new evangelization by mistake, by the way. He was in Poland speaking to his people after he had been made Pope, his first visit to Poland. And he mentioned the word new evangelization, which became, in a sense, his trademark when talking about evangelization. But going back to Paul VI, Paul VI made it very clear. The church exists in order to evangelize. Evangelization is a church's deepest identity. Without evangelization, there's no reason to exist. It's what Dick is known to tell us all the time, the Great Commission. Dick, you've told me that. So, of course, from the gospel. Go, therefore, and make and baptize all nations. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So it's active. Go. Go do something. Don't just stand still. I think for many years, um, as Catholics especially, we were very much in a passive role. We always thought that this job was merely for the priests or for the sisters, and we just sat back and, and let things happen. But that's not what it's about. Pope Francis recently noted how early Christians had nothing but the power of the baptism that gave them apostolic courage, the strength of the Holy Spirit. And he says this, we need to be faithful to the Spirit, 
to, to proclaim Jesus with our lives through our witness and our words. When we do this, the church becomes a mother church that produces children because we, the children of the church, we carry that. But when we do not, listen to this, the church is not the mother, but the babysitter that takes care of the baby to put him to sleep. It, it is a church dormant. Well, it's a dormant church. Let us reflect on our baptism, on the responsibility of our baptism to proclaim Christ, to carry the church forward. We don't want to just be babysitters. And if all we do is babysit, then nothing's happening. I don't I, I don't want a babysitter. I want somebody who's going to challenge me and call me to holiness. Second Vatican Council constantly speaks about that. How are we call to be a holy people, a new people, priestly people. A fair term to describe it must might be lukewarm. Despite the dynamic efforts of various lay organizations and some dioceses, Many people have never heard of the term new evangelization. Many regard the task of spreading the gospel as a special role for priests or missionaries and are uncomfortable about speaking about Jesus Christ. I think at times we've made the mistake of perhaps in our heads, not in reality, but in our heads, of thinking that evangelization is complicated. And what I want to do today in just a few moments is show you that Evangelization is not complicated at all. It's something that all of us can do, whether we have a PhD or whether we're in the fourth grade, we can evangelize. There are very, very easy ways of evangelization. Um, so I'm going through here. So let me just say something that I think is very important. As many of the popes and have often recalled, and Pope Francis is constantly remarking it, that the power of the first evangelizers was seen in the Holy Spirit, the gift of God poured out on the disciples on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was the initiator and driving force of the early church's evangelistic mission. And he is no less, the Holy Father says, the principal agent of evangelization today. It was the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost that enkindled in the early Christians a burning love for Christ and zeal to spread his saving word through the ancient world. I tell people all the time, if you want to become an evangelist, this is what you've got to do. Say, pray, come Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm serious about that. The Holy Spirit's going to make you an evangelist. Now, you need tools with time, I, I agree. But you've first got to have a fire to evangelize. You've got to be willing when you evangelize to make mistakes. If you're not willing to make mistakes and be made a fool, I'm giving a workshop next week on April 1st. It's next Saturday. And my title of the workshop is Fools for Christ. And the point I want to make is that we got to be fools for Christ in this work. If, we're gonna, if we think we're going to be perfect, it's not going to work. Pope Benedict, followed, following the lead of John Paul II, has spoken frequently the church's need for a new Pentecost. On an occasion, he recalled the prophecy of John the Baptist. I have baptized you with water, but he who comes after me is mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, Matthew 3.11. He then commented the Acts of the Apostles' present Pentecost as a fulfillment of such a promise and therefore as a crowning moment of Jesus' whole mission. The Spirit of God was poured out in a super abundant way, like a waterfall, like a waterfall, able to purify every heart, to extinguish the flames of evil and ignite the fire of divine love in the world. Listen to that. Let me repeat that again. This Pope Benedict, the Spirit of God was poured out in a super abundant way, like a waterfall, able to purify every heart, to extinguish the flames of evil and ignite the fire of divine love in the world. He concluded with a universal invitation. Today, I would like to extend this invitation to everyone. 
let us rediscover the beauty of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's Pope Benedict's funny, huh? Let us, I'm just kidding, let us be aware again <laughs> of our baptism and our confirmation, sources of grace that are always present. Let us ask the Virgin Mary to obtain a renewed Pentecost for the church again today, a Pentecost that will spread in everyone the joy of living and witnessing the gospel. Powerful stuff. So we want to be drenched in the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to be plunged in that divine life. It's a universal mission that the church has received and one that we should be involved in. So, with that in mind, because I don't want to give too much, I want to share with you ideas of leadership and what I've done over the years, I'm going to ask that. So I want to tell you exactly what, how things began with me. In 19, um, I went to the seminary in 1969 and 1970, I made a Curcio weekend, I'll talk about that in a minute, and it was very transformative for me, Curcio, still involved with Curcio, I just was on Curcio last weekend, I was on a men's Curcio, it was very transformative. For the first time in my life, I realized that church was not a building, even though I was in the seminary, I still had this idea of church being in a building, and all of a sudden, I realized it was the people of God coming together, witnessing to the power of the gospel. So that was in 1970. In 1971, I was introduced to the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. And from that moment on, I started going to a prayer meeting at the Seneca Retreat House in Boston every Wednesday night. And it just was transformative. It was, uh, I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was a whole new life for me. And so that was the beginning. I was ordained in 1977, sent to Salem. So this is what happened. I get to a parish that was supposedly the largest parish in the state of New Hampshire at the time, over 3,000 families. We'd have three confirmations. We had so many kids. And the church was empty. And I'd say, well, gee, this is funny. It's a and I was still naive. I thought every Catholic went to church every Sunday. I, couldn't. <laughs> I said, where are they? Well, there was a pastor up the street, Gary Clark, who was a very active Baptist, charismatic pastor. And I think half the congregation was with Gary Clark. And when I found this, I was so disturbed. It really it threw me for a loop. I said, am I in the right church? Seriously. I was so upset. I was... And I tell him, talk to my pastors, oh, don't worry about it. I said, well, I do worry about it. Like, what are we doing wrong? So as a young, newly ordained priest, of course, you're going to save the world. And um, I just began all kinds of things. I started praying. And I, and of course, having been involved with the Holy, with Charismatic Renewal, I knew that there was great power in prayer. And then right down the street at St. Basil Seminary, was Curcio was, in, was very active. And many of our people had experienced Curcio. So I started getting these people together and saying, what can we do? So right away we started looking at how we could reinvigorate the parish. And so within a matter of years, we, through the help and power of the Holy Spirit, we had many, many people involved. I'd hired a youth minister, even though I wasn't the, I was not the pastor. The pastor was very open. He said, if you want to hire, just hire her. That's fine. So I hire a youth minister, and I said, can we have a pastoral minister? Well, just fine when you can hire it. He was very great. He was good because he spent his summers at camp. He ran the camps, and he just was happy to have me run things. He was, and I was delighted as a young priest doing all these things. Started a charismatic prayer group and on and on. But I also realized that the secret was in getting small group ministry going. And so within a matter of... of um, months, I get small group ministry going, men's groups and women's groups, and we had a, within a year, we hired a youth minister, Sister Mary Ann Laughlin, who got all these kids involved, over a hundred kids every night would come to youth group, every week would come to youth group, and you can imagine, when you get a hundred kids at youth group, the parents get involved. So we started, the, we saw the church started to fill up, and all of a sudden we were having masses upstairs and downstairs, because the upstairs were so small, and then we're having masses in the gym, and things just started to blossom. It was an ex 
incredible thing. So in 1982, I was asked, much to my dismay, I have to say, to go into diocesan work. The bishop asked me if I would leave the parish, even though I had asked him if I could go to either Plastow, Hampton, or Exeter. And he said, oh, no, 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 we want you to come and work full time for the diocese. I said, what? <laughs> and I, I was really, I was annoyed at first, but I did it. And he says, I want you to take over Charismatic Renewal Curcio and a Christian Life Center, which is an adult learning center. So I did, but doing that, I just felt it wasn't enough. There was something missing. There was a whole sense of prayer that was, even though those were good movements and charismatic and pursuit, obviously very prayerful, we still needed to do more because people were going to these things, but what happens afterwards? Where's the follow-up? That was my big thing. Got to follow up with these people. And so with time, I just began uh, looking at that and saying, well, let's, let's do men's retreats. Let's do women's retreats. Let's do Advent retreats. Let's do couples retreats. Let's go up to Bitterford Pool and do charismatic retreats. And let's, let's form people. Let's make them into disciples so that they can go back to their parishes and do more because they've got to, they've got to be equipped to do that. So we started doing leader school with Curcia. We go all over the state and do leader school. I'd go to Keene one night, I'd go to Berlin one night, and then we started having these workshops for leaders of charismatic renewal prayer groups. We had over 50 prayer groups at the time in the diocese, so we got leadership going on for, I'd have a whole weekend for leaders of charismatic renewal, giving them very basic things on how to lead people, how to listen to people, how to lead them in prayer. In the meantime, the bishop said, can you open, a, can you, you, we got to look at the office of worship. I opened the office of worship, and and with time, that started going. And then I said, "Well, we need a retreat house." So I opened a retreat house, Joseph House in Manchester, much to the dismay of the bishop at the time. But it was an empty building. Might as well use it. Um, then I started a young adult prayer group. With over a hundred young adults would come on Wednesday nights. I think Dick, you were part of that. We had you know, one. Yes, we were all, I was a young adult too. I was still only 30 at the time. But anyways, but, it, but all of this, you have to remember, was done in prayer. I remember when I opened Joseph House, it was an old abandoned convent, and I went in with two guys, Dave Gerard, I remember, and, and um, Bill Cullen from London there, and the three of us, we, we knelt in front of an old statue of St. Joe. That's all there was in the building, an old copy machine. The Sisters of Presentation had lived there. My second grade teacher lived there right in the back. Sister Jack, Jackie, why don't you stand? Jackie was my second grade teacher in Berlin. <laughs> You've aged very well, Jack. <laughs> Hasn't she aged well? She was only 15, I think. When she <laughs> uh, anyway, so we, we started praying. I said, St. Joseph, if you give me the means, because my pastor at the time, I'd gone to live at St. Marie's, and the pastor there says, the parish council wants to tear this building down. We, we can't, we have no money to keep this up. The windows were broken. Some of the pipes had burst. He says, there's nothing we can do. So I said, St. Joseph, if you find me the means to be able to keep this place going, I promise that I'll go to Montreal for the rest of my life every year, and I'll, climb, I, and I'll climb the stairs on my knees, the outside stairs, which I do every year. Um, so good news is I found a way of keeping it open. Long story, you don't have time to get into that. But we opened this retreat center, started. And again, my big thing there was how can I get young adults, you know, these were college-age kids outside of high school, how can I get them to love Jesus Christ? So we form leadership teams, and they, we'd rotate. We started households for young adults who wanted to live together and start. We'd meet at five, six o'clock in the morning to pray on the fourth floor of Holy Angels School in Manchester. We'd pray for an hour every morning before we'd all go to work. It was a great time, again, a movement of the Holy Spirit. And so with time, I become... Pastor, so I'm asked by Bishop Gendron in 1988 to assume a parish that's dying, St. Marie Parish, and I'm saying to myself, this is a lot, and I didn't want it, I, this is the last thing I need, because my ministries at that point were growing out, I guess I said I was doing retreat work all over the place, doing parish missions, I had gotten Nett to come into the diocese, I invited Nett to come in, we'd started a center for spiritual direction, 
Uh, 30 years ago, I, was, I studied Kairos in the Diocese of Prison Retreat. We started Pentecost Mass, Bedford, Concord, Bedford, and finally at St. Marie's. So all these things I'm doing, and I'm enjoying it because successful. And the bishop says, no, I want you to become pastor of St. Marie's. I said, bishop, I can't. He says, I said, what about my other, oh, he says, you have to keep the other ministry. <laughs> But he says, I want, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you, this is Bishop Christian, I'm going to get you, I'm watching my time here, I'm going to get you two associates to work with you. So I get into this huge parish, 10 buildings, grammar schools closed, the high schools closed, buildings are boarded up. Get in there, and I, I, was, I went through a year-long depression. I was so discouraged. We had a $2 million debt. Collection was like $2,000 on the weekend. Church was empty. First thing I did was this. I went with my two associates, and we knelt before the Blessed Sacrament. I said, Jesus, I'm giving you permission to become pastor of this parish <laughs> because I can't do it. You've got to do it. I was depressed. I'd gone through a terrible depression, and I think it was all because there was so much going on. I was also the MC for the bishops. So I was in many, many directions. So in any case, we started praying. And so I said, okay, now it's time for me to take what I've been doing on a diocesan level and put it to life here in the parish. So how do I do that? Well, again, it, it's not about um, just doing a lot of things. It's about forming lay leaders. And that's so important. You know, we got to form people. People are willing to do something. Let them go with it. But again, if they need help, help them and that's the big thing so that's what I began to do at that point was meet with people and so I hired I had no money I had two million dollar debt had no money I hired a full-time evangelist and because somebody sent me ten thousand dollars I said I'm gonna put that to evangelization then somebody else called me up and said father you need an elevator I, I'm, I'm from Chicago and my grandfather has a thing that he put together, and I can get you 50000 for an elevator if you get the other fifty, I will do it. So we get that. And it was one thing after another that started to happen. And before we knew it, now again, things don't happen overnight. I always tell people two things are important in leadership, hard work and prayer, or prayer and hard work. It's not, it's not magic. Nothing's magic. It's a lot of work. So I started praying and working hard with my associates. And um, within a matter of time, we hired an evangelist, a young man who had been in the seminary, Tom Curran. I hired um, uh, a youth minister, two youth ministers, a couple who just gotten married. I hired them full time, part time. I was able to uh, open a bookstore. You know, and when they said, well, we have a bookstore, well, let's open one, I said. So we opened a bookstore and we got somebody to come in. At first, we we were selling old books to make money so we could get, get going, but it happened. And then, so it was all those types of things. And one thing I kept saying is people who come to church on Sundays, they don't know who, who they are. Like people just come in. So we got to start. So I started a couples group. So the first thing I did is one of the first things I just said, why don't I just have an open house for married couples? And thinking I'd get maybe six, seven people six, seven couples, ended up like, like 30 couples one night in the rectory. So we had hors d'oeuvres and we had wine. And then I said, why don't we form couples groups and you can start meeting and sharing the gospel, having fun together. And so by the time I left St. Marie's, I think I had over 100 couples meeting at different levels. I had for younger couples, couples who had been remarried and then couples who had been married for over 25 years, whatever. But it was all that type of stuff that because that's how you form leaders. See, when people are in community and they get to know each other, they get excited about being who they are. And then I get those couples to get involved with marriage preparation. That's, and they, they lead other couples. So I was at St. Marie's, as many of you know by now, I was there 26 years, not all the time as pastor. I became pastor in 1888. In 1988, <laughs> it seems like eight, 1988, and I left there in 2009. So, okay, let's look at this sheet that I gave you. 
because that's where you want to get, this is where we're going to get to work here. Okay, so I just want about the elements of the new evangelization, okay? And I pray the new evangelization is centered on Jesus Christ. It's about meeting, living, and sharing Christ. It's all about invitation. So one of the things that I do, and sometimes I do it a little too much, I'm always inviting people to participate in things. Would you like to get involved? Would you? And I'm very big on Curcio. Um, again, I think Curcio is a best kept secret that we have in some cases. You know, there are quite a few people. How many here have made Curcio? Many of you have. So you know, Curcio is transformative. In one weekend, you can do to people what you can't do in a lifetime. People are transformed. So with that model, I, I use it. I send more people on Curcio. Um, I'll send six, seven guys on a weekend. This last weekend, I wasn't that successful. I only had two, but it was two. Two that went, and hopefully they're going to get involved. Because, see, Curcio is that, and then I do follow-up. See, follow-up. I do small groups. So I meet with men on Tuesday morning at St. Mary's in Newmarket, 6 o'clock, 6 a.m., I leave the rectory next to it at 5.30. I go there. Saturday morning, 7 o'clock, I'm at St. Mark's. We have a group that meets at 6 o'clock on Wednesday morning. We have another group that meets Monday. I don't meet with all of them, but I meet with at least two. Because you got to do follow-up. We do Tuxo Divina. Then I ask these guys to get involved in different things. See, that's how you form. You begin by forming. So what Curcio to me has been extremely important. Christ renews his church. is like a mini Christian that goes on in a parish. We're starting that next year in the parish, this coming uh, year, this coming fall, I should say. We're going to be one of the parishes that's going to be um, doing the new program. We've been very involved with School of Healing Prayer. Again, at St. Mary's, I run two parishes, St. Michael's Exeter, St. Mary's New Market. We had a huge thing on School of Healing Prayer, again, to train leaders. And now, like the next coming... Tuesday night, I think it's Tuesday or Monday. Tuesday night, we have a healing mass. And again, these people get the teams and they pray, and that's leadership training, see? Prayer groups, prayer groups. Anytime you can get people to pray, get it. We want couple to couple groups. I talked about that. We just did a work, this is, again, we went to Divine Renovation Workshop in Nova Scotia this last summer. They mentioned choice wine. So I told my deacon, well, let's look into that. So we did choice wine, 10 weeks of choice wine. Some of you were there. And in the choice wine workshop, there's a DVD. Then there's time that you have a workbook, and there's time for couples to talk about their relationship. With, how do we grow marriages? My big thing as a priest has been, let's get couples to fall in love. Because if you have married couples who love each other, who are working on their marriage, that defines your parish. A marriage is so important in our culture, so important for children, so important for teenagers. So we had 67 couples who signed up for this. We just ended. It was 10 weeks. Young adult ministry, I've hired a full-time, not full-time, excuse me, a part-time young adult minister because that's a lost group. Young adults, where are they? Alpha program, we're doing alpha. So let me just say what I do with my staff as a leader, okay? I meet with my staff every other, every week, excuse me, every week. So one week what we do is we pray. We begin with praying. We pray the office. Sometimes we'll pray over each other. We pray. And then what we do is we will discuss a little bit, but it's not a big staff meeting because we want to pray. The next week we pray and then we staff. We staff for an hour, an hour and a half. So what we've been doing every other week, we've been doing divine renovation because we bought the workbook and uh, we're going through the workbook together as a staff. We're looking at what are we doing? So even at parish council, this last week at parish council at St. Mary's, we looked at how are we hospitable enough? How is our preaching? How is our music? We go through all of that as a council, trying to determine whether or not we're growing. And again, the last week, what happened again? This is where leadership comes in. One of my uh, pastoral counselors says, Father, you know, we've got a website, but we're not on Facebook in our parish. Now, I didn't even know we had Facebook at St. Michael's, but this was at St. Mary's, and the Facebook at St. Michael's really was doing St. Mary's, but I didn't know that because I can't keep up. So this guy says, 
Mike, his name, he says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get Facebook going. So he did. Within two days, we had Facebook. Now I call him. He said, it's all up and running. It's all set. So that's leadership. I didn't have to do. I just sit there and smile and walk away. <laughs> um, so that's what happens at council. So enable people. So we do. So what we're starting to do now is the alpha. So our staff is doing now alpha. So after our staff meeting, you must think I, I push people. So we staff from I do for, we staff from nine to eleven or nine thirty rather to eleven. So now what we started doing because we 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 have an alpha program going on in the parish. We get about 40, 50 people involved, but a lot of the staff couldn't be there because of other commitments. They said we'd like to see this, so we started doing alpha for the staff. So we're doing that at eleven o'clock on Tuesday morning when everybody is there. And, People have loved it. They, they've enjoyed it. It's just a great thing. We do healing masses, and I talked about that. We have healing teams that pray with people outside of the healing masses. Um, Life in a Spirit Seminar, what I want to do with um, Pentecost and the Easter season, bring us to Pentecost, we're going to be doing a Life in a Spirit Seminar open to the entire parish. And the reason is because this year is the 50th anniversary of Catholic charismatic renewal in the United States of America. And as you know, it's going to be a big Pentecost at St. Marie's this year. It's 50 years. Don't forget, June 3rd, show up. And then I put down Pentecost celebration. See, Pentecost, if you invite people to Pentecost celebration, you're evangelizing. See, evangelization isn't hard work. It's an invitation. One of the things that evangelization is most about, invitation. Invite people. Would you like to come to a couples group? Would you like to come to Alpha? We gain seven people in one week with Alpha. Because other people left. They liked it so much they invited other people. That's evangelization. See, if, if things are moving, if people like what's going on, they're going to invite other people. Eucharistic adoration, that's another way to evangelize. I'm doing a workshop this coming Wednesday on how to pray, how to do Eucharistic. And a lot of people say, Father, what do I do when I get there? I'll tell you. Just show up. <laughs> Next two weeks. Delta Ed courses. We do all kinds of adult Ed. I'm not going to get into it, but we do things. We have groups meeting in the parish every morning, every night, doing adult, whether it be scripture, whatever, a timeline. And it all works. Now, everybody has their own way. Like I want to take divine renovation. You know, it's James Mellon, Father James Mellon. How many of you are familiar with Father James Mellon and divine renovation? Now, James and I are good friends. Just so we travel together. We're good friends. that We met years ago. He was a, still a seminarian. I had gone to preach at Craig Christensen's first mass. Craig used to work for me in the office of spiritual renewal. Dick replaced him. He worked for me in the Office of Spiritual Renewal, became a priest for the Diocese of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. I preached at his first Mass, and James Mallon played the guitar at his first Mass. And years later, we were both vocation directors. We were at a conference in uh, Texas and San Antonio, and we were divided in groups. And I noticed there was this young guy after they divided us all up throughout the United States, California, the West, you meet there, and New England, you're there, and the South, you're there. And I noticed this poor guy standing by himself. So I go up to him, I said, listen, I said, I noticed you're alone. I said, we're from New England. Who are you? He said, I'm Canadian. I said, well, I'd love to have you. I said, where are you from in Canada? He said, well, I'm from Nova Scotia. I said, oh, I said, I go there all the time to give parish missions and retreats. And well, how is that? I said, well, I have a good friend there by the name of Father Craig Christensen, he goes, oh, I know Craig, I sang at his first mass. I said, well, I preached at his first mass. <laughs> so anyways, from then on, we started rooming together at the conferences for the next few years. But that's how I met James. So my point was this. We all do things differently. And James and I, sometimes we discussed, you know, like different things. Well, I wouldn't do it this way. I said, well, I would. And that's how it is. I... <laughs> I mentored him, by the way. I'm one of his mentors. He's great. Okay, the second thing, just, you know, so we, we're all different in leadership. There's no, there's no, 
there's a recipe, but it's not a clear. It's like people who don't follow the recipe. They throw in different things. Well, that's how I am. Okay, the new, number two, the new evangelization is about strengthening the church of which we are part. And I put here, you've got to take what you have. Sometimes, you know, you think we've got to always be, be doing new things, but take what you've got, because you get a lot of people who come to Mass every week, not only in the Catholic Church, people go to services in Protestant churches, even who have lost the fervor, who sometimes forget what it's all about. So you get to welcome people, like welcome people to the church. Hey, how I always do that. People leave the church. Hey, you knew, never met you before. It's so nice to have you. I put inspiring preaching. We get to preach the word of God. We got to be on fire. Good music, celebrating the sacraments with devotion. I mean, that's an e what I try to do before people receive communion. I always say, okay, you're about to receive the body and blood of Jesus. And I'll take something from the scripture, the man born blind of this weekend. Ask the Lord to open your eyes as you receive the Eucharist. After communion, I sit, I kneel with people and I say, let's just pray for, let's invite Jesus to come into our hearts in a deeper way. We just receive him in his body and blood. And when we, like a feast of the baptism of Jesus, I'll have people stand and say, we're going to make a, a profession of faith. This is a matter of life and death. So I try to use liturgical moments to educate people, okay? Then to provide opportunities I, for children, child care. We do child care at our masses, children's catechesis at our masses at the 9 and 11 o'clock mass at 9.30 in Newmarket. What we started doing is a family-based catechesis. I don't do CCD. You know what it is in the church? Sometimes you can do things forever. It doesn't work on you. So we did CCD for 100 years. It didn't work, but we kept doing it. Now, no corporation would ever work like that. So a few years ago, the same reason I got rid of uh, CCD as such, we went into new modeling for those who wanted it. But I got to say, man, we're going to do it for everyone. And it's really been a blessing. Now, does, do everybody come to churches involved? No. But this is my thing, okay? I get adults to come in with their kids who never would have, they used to drop their kids off at the public school. No, I don't do anything in public, so I do everything in the church because I want kids to know. They used to think that that was the church. We went to church. They point to the Lincoln Street School. I don't think so, but anyway. <laughs> so I said, I want to get these kids back in the church. So they can identify the building as a church, okay? Going back to my old model, I told you. But then what I do is I get in there and I, I go to every, we have four sessions a month. One is the same as three at St. Michael's because we don't have room. It's a very, we don't have room. So what I do is I welcome everybody. I go around the church. How are you? How are you doing? And How's life? And then when I see people who are consistent, I'll go up to them and say, would you like to make a tortilla week? <laughs> or would you like to get involved in whatever? You know, and like the other day I saw a guy at Mass with his wife and the two of them, so they're my next ones I'm going to go after. <laughs> you know, now, you have to remember, some people will just look at me and say, no, no, I don't want to. That's okay. So I go back maybe a month later and say, listen, I know you weren't too thrilled about this, but... Have you ever, have you thought, now it's funny, so this guy just made Christio this last weekend, he had told me no four times, and the fifth time, he said, well, I'll think about it, and he went, he loved it. So, he keep, keep inviting. So, family-based catechesis is an opportunity, and what we've done, we even have a, we have a website on it, but we even have a, um, what do you call this on your phone there, right? An app. We have an app for our religious education program. You can go to the app, find out all of our programs, because, so, Instead of telling people, put your phones away now, we tell them, oh, look, get your phones out and let's go to the app. And, and then we, we put a big screen in the church because, again, the Holy Father talks about John Paul II. How do we use media to our advantage? And so we're going to use what we can to our advantage to bring people to Jesus Christ. Okay. Three, I'm looking at my time here. How am I doing there, Dick? I do New right. evangelization is about empowerment in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we even do a life in the Spirit seminar for all of our confirmation kids. We're not the only ones. Epping does it. I, St. Marie's does it. Before confirmation, we have a weekend for the kids or a full day, and we pray over them for a deeper release of the Holy Spirit. Now, does it work on everybody? It's not my work. It's God's work. So I don't know what happens. But all I do is I do what I t I'm told to do. We also have opportunities for 
the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes, I will at Mass invite people to open their hands and say, let's pray for a deepening of the Holy Spirit. Or in my homilies, I'll say, why don't you... Um, we're, we're far from where we want to be um, as a family spiritually. It's called life, it's called life and it is messy. Um, but family formation has been great for us. And just being part of the community, being part of the church community, the kids seeing all these other children showing up as well. They don't feel isolated. They feel like, oh, there's these others, other kids who believe in God. Because when they go to school, you never hear anyone talking about God so it's it's good for them um, and also recently a when we first arrived at St. Mary's in Newmarket we had no families it was nobody was come, they'd come to CCD again and then go home but since we started faith formation we have huge amounts of families it's great you go to church and you see all these families on Sundays not just on family formation every Sunday <laughs> A church at 9.30 is full. It, it is yeah. full, yep. It's, we've seen a huge movement of the Holy families, Spirit. the Holy Spirit, and families coming together. Um, another thing that um, St. Mary's has just started is um, we've started a, a mom's rosary group um, where kids are invited because I was, there's, a, you know, I'm always going to these church events where I've got to leave the kids at home, and I just felt like, they respond so well to hearing me pray. They they want to pray with me at night. They want to. My my oldest son asks me to pray the rosary with him at night, and sometimes he falls asleep, but that's okay. Um, so we've invited children to come and be a witness to their moms or grandmoms praying the rosary, and it's okay if they color or they have a snack. Um, it's just started, so we're we're praying that the the Holy Spirit keeps showing up and. And brings that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't want, so we've got a few minutes left. Any questions? Any questions? Comments? Don't ask me anything too complicated. Any questions or comments? Yes. What are my thoughts and feelings about spiritual direction? Well, um, I think it's great. I have a, a confessor that I go to. The issue with so many is that people only want priests to do it, and we don't have time in many cases. So we're training more and more people, lay people, to do spiritual direction. My prayer is to have a woman who will see other women, Jan Moran, and she will see them as often as need be. Um, so I think it's a good thing. See, many people really don't need spiritual direction. They need spiritual friendship. There's a real distinction there. A lot of people really aren't interested in that yet. They're, they're really looking for somebody to talk with. So that's where I know it's, uh, they just mentioned small groups are so important again. Because a lot of times you can share things in a small group that will help you define what, where you're going, what your goals are. So, and even deepen your own spiritual life. So I think small group can be a wonderful way of doing I did when I was at St. Marie's, we found the John Grace, and I did for a while group spiritual direction. We'd have like 20 people at a time, and we'd take a book and we'd do group spiritual direction. We did Ignatian and we did uh, Carmelite spirituality at the time. But How would you know when you're ready? How do you know when you're ready for it? That's a good question. I guess it's a hunger you have in your heart. So if you have that hunger, go with it. Kennebunk, um, Maine, has a center of spiritual direction. They teach the Ignatian exercises. And uh, anyways, that's another place. And there are areas where they do teach spiritual direction. The only thing is I always tell people, just be careful, because sometimes they may tell you they're one thing, but they may not be. Let me leave it at that. Okay. Yes. Do you have any specific uh, stories or tips on point number four and how we use our faith to address contemporary issues and how, you know, how a faithful person responds to the headlines? Yeah, well, you know, like, I know in my parish, one in Newmarket especially, we've had a lot of division because of this political, this, this last election, etc. 
So we've been talking about that as a pastoral council. How do we address this? And I'm not sure how, I mean, it's so complex. In a day with, with the way the media is, it's so complex. But I think, you know, what we can be is keep telling people we're beyond the political system. When, no, we're not just Democrats or Republicans. We're Christians. And we've got to look beyond. So I think and a way that we can affect our culture is by talking with people, but instead of being judgmental, because I think what's happened with Facebook in recent months, we, we tell kids don't bully one another, but we bully each other on Facebook. So during Lent, I encourage my people to get off Facebook. Get off Facebook. Just do what you have to do, but don't get involved in this stuff. So we can become conduits of grace by encouraging people to look at it in a different way. So I think you know, that's a way that I would say politically and even socially we can do. Again, we've invited people to bring canned goods for the poor, which many parishes do. But that's just, again, to invite people again to become more conscious of the people around us who are in need and inviting people to get involved. For We also do once, uh, three times a year at St. Mary's in Newmarket, we open our church for homeless people. So Seacoast has a whole consortium of churches that do that. So we, they come in at, for instance, at 5 o'clock at night, and they're there till 7.30 in the morning. We provide breakfast. We provide dinner. We provide they, – they bring their own bedding. It's, it's an organization. I'll bring the bedding. But we take care of all the – day. we have people who stay there during the night. So those are all ways that we've been able to raise the level of consciousness in terms of those things in our parish community. Um, so, those are just some things. Yes? Um, Father, if I don't take this question wrong, and I hope it's not inappropriate, but you're doing a lot at the lay level with all of this, and it, it's wonderful. What does the diocese do at the pastoral level with the priests themselves who may not be so open to what you're talking about? Well, I think, hope, you know, hopefully... What the diocese is doing is placing young men in good situations before they become pastors so they can see what's happening. That's on one level. I think the diocese certainly has had enough workshops, etc., workshopping people on the new evangelization, etc. We just had things up at, Saint, at Sacred Heart of Maconia. It was last uh, spring. We had three sessions there on the new evangelization, people coming up. It was invi we invited priests and their pastoral staffs there. So all of those things are happening. But again, I think, you know, because we're fewer and fewer, and again, because people still think we've got to do everything, uh, sometimes guys just, they just get overwhelmed with everything that has to be done. Or even myself, I mean, I don't get overwhelmed. But... You know, I, I often think, I, like, you know, for instance, yesterday, I had, it was my day off, I had a funeral at 11 o'clock. I had an appointment at 4. Last night I was in, from 5 to 9 o'clock, I was in Newmarket doing ministry. So, you know, you, there's no end to the needs, the demands all around you. So, and, and years ago, I think it was much easier to do ministry. You had, you had intact families. You had people who lived together. But today, it, it's so different. I mean, it's, it's the drugs, it's the addictions, it's... It's, it can be overwhelming, and that's where you have to pray to the Holy Spirit to give you that strength, and you have to form small groups, as Andrew said, and you have to look to a thing like Alpha and those programs, again, that can help people understand Christianity and grow, and you'll hear more about that. But I just had a question about, um, like, connecting New Hampshire and Massachusetts, what states live next to each other, and they have different programs but we shouldn't be confused because we're all... I mean, I don't see us in competition. I, I go to Vermont to give missions. I go to Massachusetts. I give talks. So I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's competitive. I think, you know, we have different dioceses, and I think bishops do their best, and they have so many people that they have to deal with. So I think it's like being in a parish. You get so involved in your parish work that you... You don't know, we don't even think of what's happening in Portsmouth or Hampton because, you know, I don't think there's, I don't see competition, but, and, and let me say, I think competition's good. You know, if, 
If we didn't have competition, we wouldn't work as hard. I want my parish to be the best. <laughs> so if anybody does anything better than me, I get a little upset. It's called jealousy, one of the capital sins. Yes, go on, yes. You use the Bible in evangelizing people because they want to yeah. Do we use the Bible to evangelize? Yes, I mean, every Mass we use the Bible. You know what I mean? Like, the Mass is used, I, I, the Bible is used more than Catholics appreciate. Every Mass, we have the Liturgy of the Word. On Sundays, we have first reading, responsorial psalm from the Psalms, the second reading, the Gospel. Um, every time we start a prayer, uh, I do prayer, we use Scripture. We, we're always using Scripture. Now, I understand. But it depends where they're at. Sometimes the first thing you've got to do is, hi, how are you? You can't push the scriptures or prayer on people who are beginners. Now, I always tell people there are different levels of conversion. We're all at different places. And sometimes you deal with people who are angry and sometimes you people who don't even know who Jesus is. So you've got to take them where they're at. So sometimes the best way to evangelize is simply to take people out for a cup of coffee and listen to their pain. That can be the best thing. Then later on, when they maybe tell you three, three cups of coffee later, gee, you seem happy, what is it? And you say, well, I've encountered Jesus. And then again, leave it at that unless they ask you more, because that may be a little intimidating. Or you may say, you know, God's changed my life. And then they may say, well, how has that happened? But I think initially, it's just getting to know people. I think friendship is so important in evangelization. Just getting to know people. I mean, that's what I do even as a priest. I don't, if somebody invites me for dinner, I don't go in there and start proselytizing, even though I know they're already coming to church. But I just want to enjoy the family. And then later on, now again, I'll pray grace. And if they question me, obviously, I'll talk about it. But I just... And I tell even couples who get this, you don't have to always talk religion. Just have fun together. Go bowling or have a drink or whatever. You know, like just enjoy each other. Group ministry is so important. Not, in his case, first beginning with AA, but then going to Central Square in Cambridge, meeting a group of guys, and then realizing that some of these guys went to Mass on Sundays. It reawakened his love for the church, for the Eucharist, for the Lord Jesus. So I think a lot of those things, you know, again, there's no single recipe, but I think those are all components that can lead you to that. And I've gone over my time for 20 seconds, so I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>